the last time we looked at communion, we looked at that humble servant. And this time, I was thinking about Luke chapter 24, the road to Emmaus, when two of the disciples who had been part of the whole, we don't know their names, but two of them had been part of the, the whole uh, episodes that Jesus was arrested and, and crucified and rose for the dead, etc. And it was on that day that these two guys were walking down the road to Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking about all that had happened and they were quite discouraged and disheartened because this saviour of theirs had been killed. But there was word that he'd been risen again and, and what was happening and what was going on. And then it tells us that Jesus met them on the road. And they didn't recognise him, he didn't reveal himself to them. But he said, what are you guys talking about? And they said, oh, all the problems that have been going on in Jerusalem this last week with this rabbi from Nazareth who was, who was arrested and crucified and, and, and apparently had risen from the dead. And the Lord said to him, so, so who was that? And they said, where have you been for the last week on the moon? <laughs> this was the Jesus of Nazareth. And then the bit that got me was he started to explain to them all about himself out of scripture beginning with Moses and all the prophets and I thought beginning with Moses, Jesus he wouldn't be walking around with a scroll with the Old Testament on it or a bunch of scrolls he was there before the foundation of the world he knew what was going to happen He's, he knew what it would be like to be in that grave and he started to explain this and one of the passages out of Genesis that he would explain would be Genesis 22 <clears throat> the Abraham and Isaac thing and I want to have a wee look at that this morning because it's such a marvellous prophecy of the coming of yeah, our Lord Jesus Christ of the, the crucifixion and of the resurrection so if you want to open your Bibles <coughs> excuse me we're going to be in Genesis 22 and I want you to think about it from the point of view of these guys on the road to Emmaus being spoken to by the Lord. And as the dawning, you know, it tells us later that when Jesus had left them and they were, they were sitting there, they said, did not our hearts burn within us as he spoke these words to us? And I want to encourage you this morning. I want to encourage you that your hearts burn within you as you go to your word, as you read your Bible, as you talk about the things of the Lord, that there's that something inside you, that Holy Spirit just activates you and you just want to bless the Lord. I, can, uh, I had to make a list here of seven things that I took out of this story in, in uh, uh, 20, Genesis 22 and about our Lord Jesus Christ as well. The first one was that they were both the promises. They were both the promised seed. Abraham was promised that he would have a son, Isaac, Way back in Genesis, earlier in Genesis chapter 3, we're told that Jesus Christ was prophesied that, that, you know, that, that the fruit of Eve's womb would eventually become the one who would stand upon the neck of Satan, although Satan would bruise his heel in the, initially. So these were full. There was a lengthy interval between the promise that Abraham was given and the birth of Isaac. And there was an even longer interval between the promise that were given in the Old Testament as to when Jesus came. In fact, we know between the Old Testament and the New Testament there were 400 years of nothing. Apparently God said nothing to his people. It was a quiet time. And yet suddenly John the Baptist erupted in the scene and we, we hear the stories about Jesus. When the birth was announced, Abraham... And Sarah, his wife, were in a situation where when the Lord came to them and said, you're going to have a son in your old age, and Sarah laughed at them and said, can I have a son? <clears throat> can I bear a son when I'm old? Surely I'm too old to have a child. And the point that was made to Sarah and Abram at that point was, is anything too hard for God? That, were, that was the words that were used. And remember when, when the angel Gabriel, Gabriel came to Mary, and she said, how can this be that I have a child when I've never known a man? And what was the words that were used? Is anything impossible to God? So even 
thousands of years apart. The same thing, God's character and God's promises never change. A way back, 2,000 years before Jesus was born, Isaac was born. And God said, is anything too hard for me? And when Jesus was born, he said, is anything impossible for me? And I want you to hang on to that this morning as we study through this. That as Jesus spoke to these men on the road to Emmaus, and they may have questioned him as he started to speak, and he would say to them, is anything too hard for the Lord? Is anything too difficult for me? What else have I got here? The names of the two children were given before their birth. Isaac's name was given in Genesis 17. Do you know what his name means? His name means laughter or joyfulness. That his father was so overjoyed by him that he named him laughter. I mean, I can't imagine a child running around in a look called laughter, but... It would certainly brighten your day, wouldn't it? You're, what's your name, son? Laughter. It would, it would bring a smile to your face, but there you are. And of course, we get the situation that when Jesus was, the birth of Jesus was foretold, they were told you shall call his name Jesus, Johannes, Yeshua. And so here we are. In Genesis 21, we see that Isaac was born not randomly, and it says, if you want to read back, at that set time, at the time when God decided Isaac was born. And also, in Galatians chapter 4, when the fullness of time came, God sent his son. And that, in some measure, sums up the gospel for us. In the fullness of time, just at that point in time when the world needed it. Just at that point in time when people needed to hear the prophecy concerning the coming of the Messiah, it happened. Isaac and Jesus were both miraculous conceptions. Sarah had the child in her old age, probably. They would tell us she was 80 years old. And of course, Mary had no marital relations or sexual relations with any man, and yet the Holy Spirit conceived a child within her. So both miraculous conceptions. And so we get to this where God named Isaac, or Abraham named Isaac, laughter. When Jesus saw his, when God saw his son Jesus at his baptism, this is my son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. So we've got a picture here of the father-son relationship. You don't see it too often in the Old Testament, the father and son relationship, but here it's played out for us. Abraham, as we work through this, is a type of the God the Father, and Isaac is a type of God the Son, so a type of Jesus. So let's read, sometime later at the start of chapter 22, God tested Abraham and he said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said to him, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on the mountains I will tell you about. So here we have a situation where sometime later, we presume that it's sometime after Isaac was older. Nobody actually knows what age Isaac was when Abraham took him to be sacrificed. The Jewish tradition, and, and the, Jews, the Jews don't accept the New Testament. Get that right. The Jewish tradition says that Isaac was somewhere between 30 and 33 years old when Abraham took him for sacrifice. And that's a possibility if you actually do the maths on it, but I'll leave you to do the maths. <clears throat> because sometimes when I start to do the maths, people kind of go, and it just kind of switches off. But you look at that for yourself. Acts 17, 11. Be of a more noble character. Check the scriptures daily and make sure what you're being told is the truth. But an interesting point here, it says, take your son, your only son, now is God telling a lie here because Abraham already had a son? So is God saying to him, is this a lie that's been told? This is the son of the promise. This was the son that God promised him. Ishmael had been born prior to this because Abraham and Sarah decided that they would do it their way. That maybe this was too hard for God. They had waited long enough. And so they contrived to have Hagar conceive Ishmael. Ishmael would be the father of 
the Arab nations, if you want to call it that, if you look down through the history of the thing. So, <clears throat> your only son, the only son of the promise was Isaac, whom you love. So this is, we get this idea that the father loves the son. And remember who we're talking about here. As these two guys walked in the road to Emmaus, they would never have put this Genesis 22 together to see what was happening with Jesus, with this man that was walking beside them in the road. But suddenly the lights were starting to come on and they were starting to see what was happening here. Go to the region of Moriah. Moriah is a ridge just north of Jerusalem. And the highest point of the ridge is a place that they nicknamed the place of the skull, Golgotha. And that would be the place that Abraham would take Isaac, that Jesus would go to, the exact same spot. In fact, in between, the King David bought a threshing floor on the top of Mount Moriah. The threshing floor speaks of the fact that of judgment, that when you toss the grain in the air, that the chaff would blow away and that the good seed would fall to the ground. And so we have these three pictures of what Moriah was about, Mount Moriah. But this was to be Mount Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering. They weren't burnt alive, if you want to call it that. There was, they were killed first and then burnt. Um, but many of, the, many of the pagan gods of the time, they, they actually, as I've said to you in many teachings, that they, they killed their, their children by burning them to death, burning them alive. That little god Molech that the Canaanites had, the little brass god that was about the size of me, and it perched like this with its arms out, and they heated it up in the fire until it was red hot, and then they placed their baby on its arms. And Abraham, I suppose at this point in time, was, was he, he didn't know the true character of God, absolutely. He was still an infant, if you want to call it that, in the faith. And maybe he wondered, maybe, maybe the God that has called me to this place is much the same as the other gods that he's looking for human sacrifice and yet God never looks for human sacrifice we know that now but Abraham may not have known it at that point in time <coughs> early the next morning at verse 3 Abraham got up and saddled his donkey took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac when he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering he set out for the place God had told him about the place, the place was Moriah. The specific, the grammar there speaks to us that it's, it's a reference back to this, this Moriah, the place called Moriah. I want you to bear in mind that there's two servants here that go with them. We'll get to that later, but bear in mind that there's two servants. We've got Abraham, we've got Isaac, we've got the donkey, we've got the two servants, and they're heading off to the place I will tell you about. And in verse 4 it says, On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. Here we have this third day coming in. Here we have when God told Abraham to sacrifice his son, Abraham considered him already dead. If God said it, then that's what was going to happen. God the Father, when Jesus was on that cross, considered him already dead, but in three days something different would happen. Christ would be resurrected for the dead. And these, I believe, are some of the things that Jesus was telling these guys on the road to Emmaus, starting to open up the scripture to them and show them what was to happen and what was to come. And I want to encourage you with that this morning because from our perspective here, this story of Isaac is 4,000 years old. 4,000 years old. And yet it spoke of Christ dying on a cross on Calvary, on Golgotha, on Mount Moriah, the same place that Isaac, that Abraham took Isaac to. He said to his servants, in verse 5, Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Now if he was going to sacrifice his son, why would the plural be used there? Why would we come back to you? Because Abraham knew that Isaac was the son of the promise. Just the same as God the Father knew that Jesus was the son of the promise. And that in some measure, Abraham, was, his logic would be that if Isaac was the son of the promise and that through him all the nations would be blessed, 
and he had no children, Isaac had no children at this point in time, then one of two things was going to happen. Either Isaac wasn't going to die, or if he was going to die, God was going to resurrect him for the dead. Effectively, he would be resurrected from the dead because, as I said before, Abraham considered him already dead because God had said, take him and sacrifice him. A son that you love, can you picture it? Any member of your family. How would God speak to Abraham about that? If somebody, if God spoke to me about that, <clears throat> I would be taking him in the high court and the appeal court and all the other courts in the land saying, this can't be right, it must be something wrong with us. And yet Abraham, he loved his son, yes, but he loved God more than he loved his son. <clears throat> so we will worship and then we will come back to you. And Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac and he himself carried the fire and a knife as the two of them went on together. Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father, yes my son, the fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? So this was obviously not an unusual thing for them to do to make a sacrifice to the Lord. Isaac knew what was going on. <coughs> Again, a wonderful picture here of Isaac voluntarily carrying the wood up the hill as Christ carried the wood on his back. But think about it from this point of view. These guys on the road to Emmaus were hearing this in some measure for the first time and relating it to Christ. Christ was relating it to this and, and it must have been mind-blowing. And it's, you know, it's still mind-blowing to read this story in Genesis 22 and to compare it with the life of death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So we've got a situation here where it's only the father and the son that's going up Mount Moriah. The two servants have been left behind. And there is an opportunity here for a picture of these two servants, these two men as being the two criminals that were crucified alongside Jesus Christ. Although they were up there, they didn't see, nobody saw the transaction that happened between God the Father and God the Son on that cross at Calvary. Nobody saw what transpired between Abraham and Isaac on the same mount at the same time. Why? Well, only Abraham and Isaac were up the mountain, so there was nobody to witness it. And although these two criminals were there with Jesus, what does it tell us about the crucifixion? That at the twelfth hour, a great darkness came over the land that you could barely, it was almost tangible. And through that darkness, in those three hours, between midday and three o'clock in the afternoon, the great transaction for your soul was done between God the Father and God the Son. None of us will ever know what transpired, but we know the result of it. The result of it was that we are forgiven for our sins and three days later we were raised to a new life in Christ that we might have eternal life in him. So Abraham and Isaac, Isaac being, now watch what's happening here, he carried the wood, all the rest of it, the obedient son, Jesus the obedient son, I have come to do the will of my father, that's what he said. Although he struggled with it in Gethsemane, he only struggled for the point of view he wanted to know absolutely that this was what God wanted to do. And I'm sure Isaac said to his father, as, as, as the next verses tell us, when he laid him on that altar, he says, are you sure that this is what you want to do? Not that he railed against it. Not that he said, there's no way, because this Isaac, if he was 30 or 33 years of age, the same age that Jesus was when he was crucified, he could quite easily have overcome Abraham physically and put him in the altar. But he willingly laid himself up for this. So here we have this situation. Isaac is carrying the wood for the burnt offering. Abraham has the knife and the fire. But there's no lamb for the burnt offering. <coughs> and at verse 8, Abraham answered him, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. He doesn't say that God will provide the burnt offering himself. It says God himself. God 
will provide the burnt offering in effect. When we look forward to Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ was God Almighty and he provided himself. He didn't go and find a, another lamb, only he was good enough to be sacrificed on the cross. When they reached the place God had told them about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it at verse 9. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on the top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. <clears throat> so this is a situation where Isaac allowed himself to be bound. Just in the same way as Christ allowed himself to be bound, he trusted his father implicitly. There was no question or doubt that Isaac trusted Abraham to do the right thing. And there was no question or doubt eventually in the mind of Jesus Christ that he trusted his father to do precisely the right thing. He would submit himself to it totally. And I want to say that to you this morning that nothing is too difficult for God. If we submit ourselves to him, we have to trust him that he will do the right thing for us. Provided, of course, we are doing the right thing as well. We're not perfect. We're, we're broken vessels. But still God wants to fill us with his spirit and to bless us. Just in the same way here. And I, you know, I can just imagine these guys on the road to Emmaus. Their hearts starting to burn within them as this was all explained to them. As they got to that place. So we've got the fire and we've got the knife. Fire always speaks of God's judgment in the Bible. And this would be the judgment that would be put on Isaac if you want to call it that when he was sacrificed, if he were sacrificed. But the same judgment that was put upon Christ on the cross, when that transaction took place in the darkness of sin, all the sin of the world, all the sin that was ever committed and would ever be committed was placed upon God the Son and he sacrificed himself for that. Can you picture that? I want you to picture this. I want you to think of the most horrific thing you've ever done in your life. Something that you've never been able to forgive yourself for. Something that you think, gosh, how could I do that? How did I get involved with that? God has forgiven you. You need to accept that. You need to trust that God has done that for you. God the Son put himself voluntarily on a cross, carried that wood up the hill to Golgotha, was beaten, was crucified and died so that your sin and my sin would be poured upon him. Think of the way you felt when you did something really bad. Can you imagine all of that and everybody else who's been poured upon Jesus Christ? Just the whole darkness of sin, that transaction, and yet the Father was with him. Although he couldn't look at him, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The first time in the whole of history of mankind, the whole of history of creation, that God and the Father and God the Son, that there was a, a, if you want to call it, a break in the relationship temporarily. Why? Because God wanted to forgive you for your sin. Jesus was happily, not, well maybe not happily is the word, but contentedly going to the cross that our sin might be forgiven. And Isaac was quite prepared to accept that sacrifice. The picture of Christ. Here's Abraham with the fire. The fire of judgment. And the knife. What was it that finally killed Jesus? Physically. The spear in his side. It was a blade. You can't kill God. He gave up his life for us. But the physical act was finally completed by the Roman soldier who plunged the spear into his side. And that's exactly what Abraham was about to do, was plunge the knife, plunge the blade into his side. But the angel of the Lord called out to him, at verse 11, from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied, do not lay your hand on the boy. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. And that's twice they've said that. Do not lay a hand on the boy. 
I know now that you fear God. Sometimes when God puts us to the test, and Abraham was put to the test here, he's standing there with this knife in his hand, ready to do the business on Isaac. And Isaac had allowed himself to be bound and laid in the wood. I often wonder, I often wonder, and it's a question I would love to ask, I wonder if Isaac was laid out in the altar like that and bound to it. Just the same as Jesus was laid out in the altar of the world's sin. Sometimes when God puts us to the test, he doesn't want us to go through with it. He just wants to see the heart attitude toward it. When he asks us to do something that we think, oh gosh, Lord, couldn't do that. But when we show a heart attitude that's open to him, that's trusting to him, here we have this situation, and I can't emphasise it enough, Isaac trusted Abraham implicitly. That father-son relationship was tight. In the same way that Jesus trusted God the Father, it was tight. Nobody was going to break that. Do not lay a hand. Now that I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. And Abraham looked up and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. And he went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place the Lord will provide. Jehovah Jireh. Is that what you need this morning? The Lord will provide. There are impossible situations in our lives where we think, God, where are you? What's happening here? <clears throat> Something needs to happen. And yet, miraculously, God provided. God gave the answer. And if you don't know Jesus Christ this morning, that's exactly why Jesus went to Calvary's cross. This was the answer. This was Jehovah Jireh, that God will provide. He was the sacrifice for sin. If you need forgiveness for sin, then it's there. All you have to do is accept it. A dreadful and horrible death. And yet, when we look at Isaac now, we see him resurrected. He was dead to the Father. And yet, there was a reprieve for the sin. And it says there that the angel of the Lord... Now, I want you to consider this and go and look for it yourself. Whenever we see the words, an angel of the Lord... We think it's just an angel. Just any old angel. Well, no any old angel, but... When we talk about the angel of the Lord, to me, that is an appearance of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. The angel of the Lord cried out, Abraham, Abraham, hold your hand. So Christ, to me, was present even at this enactment of what was to come. And I'm quite sure that this was a... There was something that was opened up to... To, to Abraham that God would show him that in this picture of him taking Isaac up Mount Moriah that this would be fulfilled 2,000 years later on the same mount but only this time for real and the angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said I swear by myself declares the Lord but because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand in your seashore. I suppose it's a bit of hyperbole, a bit of exaggeration here, but who knows? I, I went back in again and looked again, and in this galaxy that we are in, we think, we think there's a hundred billion stars. And outside our galaxy, there are a hundred billion galaxies. Roughly. And if you put all that together, you get a number that's 10 with 24 nothings behind it for the number of stars in the sky. For, from time was beginning in biblical time, there's only been 10 with 13 nothings behind it seconds in the world. So this is twice as many as there's been seconds since the start of time God is going to bless your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky well we can't say that that's the Jewish people because they're not as numerous as the stars in the sky in fact they've been so persecuted over the years that there's probably only 20 or 30 million Jews in the world at the moment although I do believe that there are many people running around today who are Jews but don't know it Anyway, that'll come in the last day. 
But here we are, the numbers of stars in the sky, the sand and the seashore, so who are they? They're you and I, guys. The millions upon millions of people who have put their trust in Jesus Christ. That's the blessing that came through Abraham. Abraham believed God and it was accredited to him as righteousness. And you guys have believed God, that God the Son died on that cross and it has been given to you as righteousness. You don't stand in your own righteousness. When God looks at you, he sees a a, I was going to say a crimson soul, a, a white soul that's been washed in the blood. There's no mark or blemish on it. You guys are forgiven because of what Christ has done on the cross. And this foretells it. 2,000 years before Jesus came, this foretells it. And 2,000 years now, 4,000 years ago, Isaac's story still resonates through history for those who would accept Christ as Lord. And through your offspring, all the nations of the earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. Then Abraham returned to his servants and they set off together for Beersheba. And Abraham stayed in Beersheba. So where was Isaac? Abraham returned to his servants, so where was Isaac? He turns up later, but he w where was Isaac? You know, in the next few chapters, and, and I, I, I want to continue this, this theme that, that I want you to get across to you about Christ, Isaac being a picture of Christ. Because in the next few chapters, Abraham, the father, would ask his chief servant, to go and find a bride for Isaac. Now don't go amongst the Canaanites, don't go amongst the uninitiated, go back to my own people and find a bride. And he found Rebecca. And Rebecca was a Gentile. And Isaac's bride would be a Gentile. Jesus Christ's bride is a Gentile. And who was this servant that Abraham sent? Don't know. I believe it was the Holy, a picture of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit will not speak of himself, but will only glorify God and glorify the Son. This Spirit was sent into the world to gather the church. And you're being gathered at this time. Be encouraged, guys. As we take these elements today, let's remember the great sacrifice that was done. Let's think about what was prophesied, what Jesus said to these guys on the road to Emmaus. By the time he got to the end of this, and I'm sure he took many other passages, but this would be, I'm, I'm quite sure, would be one of them. If I was one of the guys in the road to Emmaus, my heart would be burning with him. I think, my goodness, what's going on here? This is the truth. This is the greatest story ever told. And Lord, as we come now to, to take the bread, Lord, At that last supper, Lord, that Passover supper that you celebrated, that afikomen, that special piece of matzah would be broken and you would pray over it and you would say, Blessed are thou, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who gives us bread from the earth. But you didn't. You said, This is my body broken for you. Eat of it, all of you, and remember me. And so we thank you for it, Lord. And after supper, that, well... After supper, that fourth cup, that fourth toast. Blessed are thou, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who gives us fruit from the vine. But no, he didn't say that prayer. He said, this is my blood, a new covenant in my blood. Drink of it, all of you, and remember me until I come again. Brothers, if someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore him gently. But watch yourselves. Or you also may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks he has something when he has nothing, he deceives himself. Each one should test his own actions. Then he can take pride in himself without comparing himself to somebody else. For each one should carry his own load. Yes, Lord, we thank you and praise you for your wonder and your glory and your mercy and your love, Lord. That this story of Isaac and Abraham, Lord, a true reflection of the father and son relationship. And Lord, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for that great sacrifice, Lord. And as we go through this place this morning, Lord, help us to go knowing that we are forgiven, Lord. That there's nothing that you hold against us because we're washed in the blood and born of the Spirit. And so, Father, bless us this day. Walk with us as you always do. 
Keep us in the straight and narrow, Lord, as you always do. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.